What's happening, everybody? This is Cameron Rhodes with the Guided Trip Fly Fishing Podcast. Have any of you seen this product called Man Can? Man Can is set out to provide an alternative solution to the conventional cans, bottles, and growlers for craft beer lovers and homebrewers, and it start out in a garage, just like this podcast, but except I'm in a kitchen. Um, in 2017, at the National Hardware Show in, Ve- Show in Vegas, Man Can was awarded Editor's Top Choice in the Tailgate, Backyard, and Barbecue Products category. If you haven't checked out the Man Can, you need to. It's a mini keg. You fill it up with beer at a local brewery, boom, you seal it, done. It's good for the lifetime of the beer till you open it. Um, little 64-ouncer I take anywhere I go. I got two of them. I put one in my truck. I leave one at home. If I am traveling or if I'm fishing around and I find a new brewery, I can just take my man can in, fill it up. Better than using a glass growler. Glass growlers can break under pressure. It also doesn't hold the pressure that you're looking for to keep that beer nice and smooth and crisp like the brewer intended it. So check out man can. A 64-ouncer is just about 30 bucks. I also have a picnic keg, which is a 128 ouncer. I can put a little tap system on it when I'm here with guests sitting in my kitchen. Like I said, break out the man can. Boom, I got craft beer on draft. Little CO2 fills the can up and keeps it pressurized, and I can pour draft beer right from my home. Um, picnic keg is about 50 bucks. And if you're feeling crazy and you might, might be a brewer at home, check out the brewer kit. Um, it's about 325 bucks, bucks. That gets you five cans and a tap system. That's a heck of a deal. So check out Man Can. It's an awesome product. Like I said, I have a couple of them. I love them. Um, keeps my beer fresh. Check them out. You can find Man Can online, mancan.beer. That's the website right there, no.com, just mancan.beer. You can also find them on their Instagram page, Man Can Beer. Check them out. Awesome. I love them. Um, follow their Instagram page. Um, you can find me at on Spotify or CastBox. Just search my name or search The Guided Trip, and you'll be able to pick me up. I'm also on Instagram. Don't forget to follow me, Cameron.Rhodes, and see what's going on. So this next podcast we got coming up, um, this is a part one of a two-part series I'm trying to do. Maybe a three-parter. Who knows? We'll check it out. Uh, but I sit down with Dan Brow. Dan Brow is an aquatic biologist for the Colorado Parks and Wildlife in Gunnison. He's in charge of many operations involving trout and salmon throughout the state. Um, he's just an encyclopedia of knowledge when it comes to fish. I definitely learned a lot about kokanee salmon and the process it takes for a salmon fry to make a trip down the river. Um, and when I say salmon fry, I mean a minnow-sized salmon about one and a half inches in size. Um, there's definitely a reason I split this up into two parts. So please listen to part one. Um, I promise part two will be worth your time. Um, Check it out. Let me know what you think. This is the Guided Trip with Cameron Rhodes. Thank you, guys. Enjoy. Not a huge deal if not. Okay. Um, So, yeah, Dan, why don't you go ahead and tell us about yourself, what you do for the state, and we'll jump right into it. Okay. Yeah, my name is Dan Brow, and I'm in a quack aquatic biologist for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, I've been in that position here in Gunnison since 1996. Uh, Prior to that, I did work a few years up at Roaring GD Hatchery as a fish culturist, helping with uh, raising fish uh, for local stocking as well as spawning and uh, stocking out kokanee. Awesome, man. I want to thank you for sitting down with me and taking the time out of your busy schedule to do this. Um, But uh, so... The reason we're here, uh, I want to talk to you about something that we have in this valley and in Gunnison that doesn't happen around the state or around the country very often. Um, What we're going to talk about is the salmon release, Um, kokanee salmon release, that is, and what we do for the release, what you do for the release um, in general. But how I want to start is tell us a little bit about the kokanee salmon, what the kokanee salmon is for people who don't know what it is. Okay. Yeah, so kokanee are just a landlocked uh, sockeye salmon uh, that uh, naturally developed in lakes in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, In Colorado, we just really didn't have large, deep lakes or reservoirs historically. So when we started building dams and creating that habitat, kokanee were naturally a species that we wanted to utilize uh, within those lakes. And so we imported kokanee. Um, into Colorado. Our kokanee came from Flathead Lake in Montana, 
who uh, they were stocked in Flathead from Lake Watcomb in Washington, where they're native. So, so we we uh, brought in kokanee and uh, began stocking them. And in Blue Mesa, we did stock kokanee right after uh, Blue Mesa began filling filling in 1965. So why why did you want to utilize the kokanee salmon? Well, kokanee just do such a good job of feeding on zooplankton in open water portions of the reservoir, growing very fast and providing a great fish for people to catch. I didn't know that they do that, so that's cool. (laughs) You learn something new, right? (laughs) Um, And so us as a county and as a hatchery here, um, we talked about a little bit earlier before we started recording this, but we do provide um, eggs for around the state as well, or fry for around the state. Is it eggs or fry? Um, Uh, Both? Yeah, Certainly, uh, we bring eggs from our spawn take and provide those to other hatcheries to raise fry for stocking. Do you, do you know off the top of your head what what hatcheries around the state we we do provide for? Um, yes, yeah, so generally, uh, when we're producing a lot of coconut eggs from this run, we provide most of the eggs th- throughout the state. Uh, could be eggs going to Mount Chavanel, to Glenwood Springs to the Durango Hatchery wow. uh, and to Glenwood Springs. So, And then do we go, um, do you go out of state as well? Uh, so generally we'll take care of our in-state needs, but if extra eggs are available, we will provide those to other states. And certainly there are years where we may be short of uh, kokanee or other species of eggs, and so we do share with other states. When, when is the last time the we've been short? <laughs> uh, uh, for kokanee, yeah. uh, quite often it's tough to get kokanee eggs from other states, but there are a lot of other species that we get from other states regularly. Gotcha. And uh, every year we're importing eggs uh, into Colorado to support stocking. What, what other some species, species are we importing? Uh, species of uh, looking at trout, um, species uh, like golden trout, uh, we are able to get from Wyoming. Uh, uh, certainly have other uh, species such as brook trout that are easy to get from Wyoming and many of our warm water species uh, uh, we're stocking millions and millions of of small uh, fry and and so we're trading with other states for uh, that's awesome those species yeah. that's very cool how often are are we sh- short on kokanee if I mean again off the top of your head I, I mean it doesn't I wouldn't in my head when I think about it I wouldn't think it happens very often yeah it does happen um, occasionally uh, the the last year that we were short was in uh, 2015 I believe and uh, in those cases we generally uh, focus on stocking our brood waters uh, our places that are providing kokanee eggs for future stocking and some of the other waters that we'd like to stock we may have to back up off on if we're short gotcha so now we'll kind of now that we have a little bit of history about the kokanee and what we what we do around here in gunnison for the states and states around us a little bit um i'd like to talk about the release process and what we need um for the release you know kind of your process through the release um you know obviously there's going to be a lot of factors for the release um and i mean it's we'll we'll say it's coming up quick we'll put it that way but (laughs) Um, so talk about your process for the release, you know, kind of, I guess from start to finish, if you wouldn't mind, um, you know, time period, water levels, you know, kind of, let's, we can walk through all of it and kind of check it out. Okay. The, the first thing that really drives our kokanee release here locally is our need to keep the life cycle going. So we need those adult fish when they're mature to come back to the hatchery. And we've learned that to do that, we need to release our fry from the hatchery. Uh, we have tried to bring truck fish down uh, to a, just above Blue Mesa on the Gunnison River, but we found that when we do that, the fish just don't uh, make it back up to the hatchery. The imprint of that trip down uh, is broken if we truck them down. So we need wow. to stock them from the hatchery. Uh, and to do that, uh, there are several things we need to be aware of. Um, uh, certainly during the release, if we wait too long, there are lots of irrigation diversions uh, between the hatchery and Blue Mesa Reservoir. And you're talking irrigation towards branches and everything like that as well. Yeah, okay. primary flooded irrigation later in the season. Early on, it's primarily stock water. But as we move into the spring season, uh, there are many ditches pulling uh, irrigation water for flood irrigation of hay primarily. And in those situations, if kokanee get 
pulled into those ditches, they're not going to make it back into the river and make their way down to Blue Mesa. They end up in the fields. Uh, so that's the first thing we need to do is make sure that we're releasing our kokanee prior to most of those ditches coming How online. often do you see kokanee that do enter the ditches and end up in fields? Was that a big... Um was that a big concern early early on in the days where you're going, oh, man, we need to fix this. You know, coconut ended up in people's fields, and we need to look more into the, this irrigation problem. Yeah, certainly there were years where it happened to a greater degree than others. The, the most recent year that we were taking a close look at that was in 2002. And uh, during that year, we saw major losses of fish into a couple ditches. And uh, at that point, we knew we needed to solve that problem. And... Uh, uh, worked on ways to try to screen d ditches, uh, put trap nets in ditches to move fish back. Uh, but the key is really trying to get our kokanee stocked prior to those ditches coming online. That's that's really the the number one priority on timing of the release. Gotcha. So we know location now up at the hatchery. Um, how far is the hatchery away from Allmont, Colorado? It's just a couple miles from Allmont. It's about four miles. Gotcha. Yeah. And so the process that the fi uh, these salmon fry have to go down it you said it's about 22 miles to beaver creek um mm -hmm. which is just west of gunnison pretty close to blue mesa reservoir um mm -hmm. we were talking about it earlier it might be around 26 miles or so all the way to blue mesa reservoir um that's a long ways for a little tiny fish to go in a short period of time how how long does it take usually take for those fish to go um, get all the way down to, do you know how long it'll take? We do just from having many years of, uh, Didn't make you stocking put you on the spot with that yeah. one, but no, we, we've certainly spent a lot of years out there where we are stocking our kokanee and then tracking how quickly they're moving down. And quite often it, it may be a ditch that we are trapping or screening that will note when the fish hit those ditches. And so generally, uh, they can be down to the reservoir as quick as five hours, which is pretty incredible, but that's closer to flows of a couple thousand CFS. On the low flow standpoint, if, if you're looking at flows of a couple hundred CFS, a that like travel time year. yeah, travel time is going to be closer to 11 hours gotcha. for the first kokanee to hit the reservoir. And so you brought it up, you, well, before we started recording, we talked about it a little bit. Um, how, many, how many are you guys releasing on average about a year? Okay, since 2009, we've been stocking about 3.1 million kokanee from the hatchery. Uh, we do stock a, a f about 400,000 into the reservoir as well, so a total is around 3.5 to 3.6 and that's every year? million kokanee annually. Yeah, every year. <laughs> that's, that's a lot to get down in five to six hours in high flows. So in low flows, I mean, that's, that's a lot of movement for those fish. It's going to be tough. Um, and I mean, this year we're looking at a low water year. I, I mean, I looked at CFS the other day and it was 230. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty what we low. are today. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty low. Yep. Um, what, how's that going to affect it? So that it will certainly take longer for Kokanee to reach the reservoir. Uh, generally it's difficult to significantly shift that though, because we, we need to, uh, get Kokanee stocked before irrigation ditches come online. So we kind of have to work with what natural flows we have. Gotcha. Um, now we can try to get a little bit of extra water from Taylor Park That's Reservoir. Gonna, that was my next question. But even that, um, it's not going to significantly change the situation. Uh, it's still going to be fairly low flow. And then we we haven't hit on it yet, but obviously a moon, the moon cycle is is, is a huge deal. Um, is it is it more for? I mean, are you looking for a new moon or a full moon, or what's what's the best kind of scenario for that? Yeah, so uh, we do stock our kokanee fry at, at night, and the intention is to stock them at a time where predation will be as low as possible in the river. Uh, browns and rainbows in the river will prey on these two-inch kokanee uh -huh. that are stocked. <laughs> so we try to stock them in the dark as much as we can, so a new moon is what we want. The trouble with that is they only come every 28 days, and the timing often isn't ideal. So The um, window is very short. Exactly. So a lot of times we, uh, what we try to do is wait till the ice goes off of Blue Mesa. Uh, we do want zooplankton production to begin picking up. And so that's kind of our trigger uh, to try to stock kokanee as soon as uh, we can to the ice off period. Uh, but then we're, we're looking at trying to complete the, the plant within about a week, which often isn't uh, during the new moon. So uh, we love it when we can hit the new moon, but uh, we have looked at the level of predation in the river, even during a full moon, 
and uh, we had estimated up to about 10 percent of our kokanee plant uh, can be lost during that night's release. And out of 3.5 million, 10 percent, I mean, it's a few for, for anglers, it could be a fair amount. Um, yeah. For as for you know biologists, it's 10 percent out of 3.5 isn't too much of a number for you guys. You go, ah, that's all right. Yeah. Um, and it really we we stock numbers to overcome that loss. So. Uh, that's really how we handle that. We know gotcha. that there's a certain amount of loss, and we just stock enough kokanee to overcome that loss. So, what do you what do you think? So, as as we go into that, what do you think a success rate is like? Um, you know, for you know, not only predation, but um, I mean, like you said, head you know, fish going into head gates or irrigation ditches. Um, obviously, there's going to be a loss of fish going down river just for natural causes right i mean there's very small little fry going down what do you think a success rate is on on a year um i mean in your mind what would you think you, we get out of it uh so in the year we know that we lose a certain percentage during the night of the release uh some fish are not going to make it down they may get caught in uh, a back back eddy or eddy something, or something. Yeah. um and then once they hit the reservoir we lose some um within that initial week especially that's really when the predation from browns gotcha. and to a lesser degree perch perch tend to not be as active and we don't see them preying on the kokanee near as much as we see with brown trout uh, but that's generally about a week-long period where that predation is going on and after that we really don't see that so um, but if you're looking at an annual basis there's predation that continues to occur um, lake trout are going to be uh, preying on kokanee during a much broader, longer time period, um, and really, for the most part, can prey on kokanee for the rest of their most of their lives right. within the yeah. reservoir. But uh, so, uh, as far as annual survival, um, you can only tell once guess, they start you know, running up, right? I mean, is that a good way yeah, to tell? So, the survival to mature fish in the run, you and, look at it a couple percent. Okay. So that's fish that make wow. it the. Yeah. And so, what does it take for? Circle? for these fish to, once they enter Blue Mesa, how long does it normally take for them to enter a run? Um, I, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it's interesting. What we've seen is it depends on how many are within the reservoir. When kokanee are more crowded and there are greater numbers within the reservoir, they tend, tend to run a year earlier, tend to run primarily as two and three year old kokanee. Gotcha. Uh, that drives the size down uh, of fish in the spawning run as well. Uh, but when they're less dense in the reservoir, they tend to run as three and four year olds primarily. Gotcha. That's kind of what I figured. I, I've heard it was about three years, but you know, obviously, I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. It's not my living. <laughs> um, I catch them. That's about what I do. Um, so last year, what I heard from is that we we had a very good year for the kokanee run. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, we we over the past couple of years, you know, if you're thinking two to three years or two to four years, I guess, for mature fish to move up river. The last couple of years have been pretty successful. Um, and, am I correct with that? That we yeah. Last year we had a pretty good run and we had good numbers of eggs and everything that we were getting. Um, yep. Yeah, the last two years we've had really good fishing in the reservoir during the summer and we've had great kokanee spawn takes, record spawn takes at around 17 million the last two years. And uh, that really has been benefited by the reduction in the bag limit. Uh, so uh, anglers are now able to only keep five kokanee in the reservoir during the summer instead of ten that they could previously wow. keep. So cut in so, half. So that's really likely increase the number of adults that are in the reservoir that are then able to run upstream and uh, that we're able to take eggs from. Definitely. So that's likely created a bump in our spawn takes the last couple of years and I, I definitely we talked about it a little bit earlier but i want to you know at some point i'd like to sit down in the fall and go over you know the kokanee run instead mm -hmm. of the kokanee release and talk about that because there's definitely a lot to do with the kokanee run and a lot of work involved for that and i know it's a huge part of the year and there's a lot going on with everybody you know up, especially in the fall it's a busy time of year for everybody around here um, but i do want to sit down and go over that in the fall um for the most part, I mean, we learned a lot about the release, what's going to be happening. Um, we're not going to give it away right uh, right now when the release is going to be. Um, this is kind of the, the part one of our part two, but um, I do want to thank you again for taking the time to sit down. Um, 
we do know the release is going to be happening shortly. Um, mm-hmm. And so um, you're a busy man. We'll let you get back to it and uh, figure out what you need to do. But thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate you sitting down and talking about this. Um, and it was, it was great information. I definitely learned a lot, so I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, I'm and happy to chat with you. We'll have you on again in, in the fall, hopefully, and we can talk about the Kokanee Run. That sounds great. Awesome, man. Thank you very much. You bet. All right, I want to make sure everybody heard that correctly. 3.5 to 3.6 million one and a half inch minnow sized salmon fry are going to be screaming down river only one night of the year. <clears throat> it's pretty interesting. Now, why would I be doing a podcast about that? A fly fishing podcast. Why would I be interviewing? an aquatic biologist about this. Why would I be interested in the millions of fry going down river? Think about it. Be interesting to see how the predatory fish react. Keep that in mind. We're going to do a part two on this. And like I said at the beginning, you're not going to want to miss part two coming up soon thank you guys for checking out the guided trip you can find me on instagram cameron.roads find me follow me you can also find this podcast a lot of different places spotify cast box the link in my instagram we're going to be booking trips here soon for the summer and anytime really from here on out so if you're interested in booking a fishing trip with me you can email me the guided trip at gmail.com. We'll get you set up from there. Also, don't forget to check out the Three Rivers Guide School if you're interested in becoming a guide. Listen to episode four podcast with Patrick Blackdale. Um, we go into depth about the guide school, what it's going to be. So don't forget to check it out. It's coming up quick, May 10th through the 16th. So it's only a month or so away. You can find anything you want to know about the guide school at Three Rivers website. It's number three riversresort.com. They'll have a link there to the guide school. Check it out. It's an awesome program. Like I said, also check out episode four with Patrick Blackdale. It's it's a good program. So if you're interested in being a guide, look into it. It's worth your time. Stay tuned for part two of the Kokanee release. Thanks guys.